Joan Jed has been defying expectations her entire life. When she was a kid, her first music teacher told her that girls weren't cut out for rock and roll. Later on, her first band, The Runaways, was subjected to the same kind of sexism. They were often even the targets of violence from scumbag audience members who weren't ready to accept women as rock stars. Jet had to constantly prove herself to critics and enemies who couldn't seem to be able to grasp the fact that women could rock with the same bravado and chops as males. She had to swim upstream for years to get anywhere in the music industry. Her first album was even rejected by 23 different record labels before she finally found someone willing to give her a chance. None of these roadblocks were enough to stop her, though. She was driven and committed. Blackheart Records, the label she started when no one else wanted to distribute her music, still exists. And after spending 40 years living as an LGBT woman in a heterosexual male-dominated industry, she's stronger and more resilient than ever. Her influence and the ubiquitous nature of her songs like I Love Rock and Roll and Bad Reputation would have been enough on their own to keep her memorable. But there is far more about Joan Jett we've come to appreciate and admire. Her story is full of roadblocks, controversy, and tragedy, but it's one worth telling. Who says girls can't play rock and roll? Joan Jett was born September 22, 1958, in Wynwood, Pennsylvania. Her parents named her Joan Marie Larkin, but she would choose the stage name Joan Jett when she started taking her music seriously in her late teens. When she was 13, she received her first guitar for Christmas, but she was told by her instructor that, quote, girls can't play rock and roll. Jane could care less what he thought and kept on rocking without a care. Her family ended up moving to West Covina, California when she was 15. Once there, she started frequenting Rodney Bingenheimer's English Disco, an all-ages glam rock club on Sunset Boulevard. It was there she met some of the most influential movers and shakers of the Southern California music scene. She also started experimenting with her image. That's when she started wearing black leather with black eyeliner and sporting her signature black shag hairdo. She was inspired both musically and aesthetically by Susie Quattro, who reaffirmed to her that girls could indeed be successful rock and roll stars if they wanted. At the club, she met drummer Sandy West through producer Kim Fowley. Through Kim, Jet and West were subsequently introduced to the other musicians who would eventually form the Runaways. Hey, if you're enjoying this video so far, make sure you give it a like and subscribe, and click the bell icon to stay updated. Stay tuned to find out why the Runaways eventually disbanded and how Blackheart Records rose from its ashes. Dirty, Sexy Rock and Roll The Runaways consisted of Joan and Sandy in addition to lead guitarist Lita Ford, bassist Jackie Fox, and lead singer Sherry Curie. Joan and Fowley did the majority of songwriting for the band, including their early hit song, Cherry Bomb, which helped put the band on the map. The girls wanted to be rock stars, like their idols, the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin. They wanted to put out what they called dirty, sweaty, sexy rock and roll music, but not everyone believed in their vision. When people told them girls couldn't play rock and roll, what they really meant was that they shouldn't because it implied sex. More specifically, it meant that they were in charge of their sexuality and owning it. It was a direct threat in their eyes to the patriarchal establishment. Magazines constantly ran sexist headlines and articles back then, focusing on the band members' age, gender, and looks instead of their music. To make matters worse, Kim Fowley encouraged this kind of behavior by constantly calling the band members inflammatory and degrading names, keeping them strung out on drugs without money of their own, and he even encouraged Sherry Curie to go out on stage in her underwear in addition to posing for sexually charged photo shoots. Audiences were equally abusive. Jet and the rest of the band were constantly subjected to verbal and even physical abuse at their shows. It wasn't uncommon for the musicians to be covered in spit by the end of a gig. It was dehumanizing, to say the least, and for the longest time, they couldn't seem to wrap their minds around what the problem was. Everything was falling apart. The Runaways released five albums in four years as they toured the globe. As time went by, they found more respect and success. After landing a number one album in both Australia and Japan, they started receiving a reception that Joan compared to Beatlemania. Right around that time, a couple of change-ups were made to the band's lineup. Jackie Fox ended up getting sick and left the tour to be replaced by bassist Vicky Blue. And after Sherry Curie left, Joan took over lead vocals. 
According to band members and their parents, Kim Fowley continued his abusive pattern of mistreating the band members. Not only did he deny them schooling and health care, he also did his best to dial up the drama by pitting the band members against each other. In 1978, Vicky Blue left the band and Lori McAllister took over as bassist. The Runaways played their final show on New Year's Eve 1978 in San Francisco. According to Joan, Sandy, Lita, and a producer named John Alcott had formed a camaraderie of sorts and she wasn't a part of it. The band was falling apart and she didn't know how to stop it. So to avoid being fired, she made the difficult decision to leave. What might have initially seemed like a risky move, however, proved to be the beginning of an exciting new chapter of Jet's career. The Birth of Blackheart To deal with the pain and frustration of the Runaways' breakup, Joan says she started drinking. She was angry, and justifiably so, but she didn't know how to make sense of things, and the bottle gave her the temporary sense of relief she needed at the time to get by. She continued to live on the edge while recording music for a film that the Runaways were commissioned to record a soundtrack for. This was right around the point she met Kenny Laguna, a producer and manager who she would enjoy a lifelong creative relationship with. After being hospitalized for a heart infection, Joan went overseas to record a self-titled album in Europe. 23 different record labels rejected the album, so Joan and Laguna decided they would form their own indie label and release it themselves. That's how Blackheart Records came to be. Laguna used to sell the album out of his trunk after shows and had a difficult time keeping up with the demand. It was a huge success and the beginning of a label that would thrive for the next four decades. She Loves Rock and Roll Joan's first album with the Blackhearts, I Love Rock and Roll, was released in 1981. It was a smash hit, reaching number two on Billboard's Hot 100. The title track was a cover of a song by the Arrows that Joan had been performing live for years. It went on to become one of the best-selling singles of all time. It sat at the top of the charts for seven weeks and was the third most popular song of 1982. To this day, the album remains Jet's most successful work. It sold 10 million copies and has even been inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame. The song's enduring popularity was boosted by the fact that it received a lot of airplay on the newly launched and hugely influential TV network, MTV. 1982 also saw three more top 20 hits, including Bad Reputation and the band's cover of Crimson and Clover and Do You Wanna Touch Me. Kim Fowley hurt people and Joan might have known about it. Fowley died in 2015. But in the documentary Edge Play, a film about the Runaways, Jackie Fox revealed that Fowley had a history of grooming the young girls in the band. She further admitted he had raped her while she was in the band and still a teenager. She asserted that other band members, including Jet, had known about the incident but chose to do nothing about it. Joan issued a statement denying the allegation, maintaining if she had known about something like that happening to any one of her bandmates, she wouldn't have stood by and let it happen. When asked about Kim in 2018 by the New York Times, Jet reaffirmed that she doubted the validity of the accusation, but pointed out she can't really speak definitively to what Fox experienced. At 62, Joan is still rocking just as hard as she did in the 70s and 80s. The only difference is now she has very little to prove. She's already shown the world, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that girls can rock just as hard as any of the boys. Now we'd like to hear from you. What's your favorite Joan Jet song? Let us know in the comments section below. And before you go, make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Click the bell icon to stay updated on all our latest content.